It's a pleasure to come back to the University of Georgia. And uh, it's always good when you talk to an audience to kind of find a way to relate to them. So let me just tell you my experience at the University of Georgia. Um, in 1961, I spoke in, at a pain college trying to organize um, African-American students to challenge the system of segregation in Georgia. <clears throat> During those days, we would catch a bus, and like a milk bus, you know. I caught it in um, Augusta. It brought me around to Athens on the way to Atlanta. So I got here around midnight. And I had to use the restroom because during those days, you know, folks, they did not have restrooms on the buses, okay? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you were in between the stops, you were in trouble. <laughs> and so I got off the bus because I was in trouble. And I went in, and when I, when I walked in, colored restroom, white restroom. So I had uh, just finished talking about the evils of the second system. And I don't know why I took through caution to the wind and I decided to go into the white restroom to relieve myself. So when I came out, uh, he was a bit barely shared, waiting to arrest me. And he took me to jail and uh, I asked if I had the opportunity to call a lawyer. And he told me yes, but I didn't get that chance until about 3 o'clock in the morning. He came to my cell and said, okay, you can talk to your lawyer. What's his name? What's his phone number? And I gave, I said, it's attorney Donald Hollowell. Um, of course, they knew who Hollowell was. And so I got Mr. Hollowell on the phone. I got his wife first. And she was exact, not exactly pleased that I would call that three something in the morning. <laughs> but I said to Mr. Hollowell, that, uh, I'm in trouble. I'm in jail. <laughs> Let me speak to your husband. So Mr. Howell came on the phone and in his very quiet, deliberate way, he wanted to know, well, what did you do this time? What are you in there for? And I told him, well, let me speak to the sheriff. I do not know what he told the sheriff. The sheriff said, yes, sir, at the end of a long conversation. And he let me out and brought me back to the bus station about, uh, Four o'clock, and the next bus didn't leave until six. So I was out here in the same place where I was arrested, by myself, just me and the ticket agent. Um, so that was my one of my experiences here at Athens. Another was when I came here in '69 to begin my public administration uh, degree, uh, and I found it to be a very different kind of place. Uh, it was like, in some areas, it was like an oasis in a desert segregation and discrimination. And another time I came here was when I came to Hill Hamilton home in Charlene. You had a gentleman here who was the head of the Episcopal Society. He was a Episcopalian priest. Came to Atlanta and asked me to come down. I think I came three times that spring. They kind of snuck me in and snuck me out, you know, because uh, uh, there was no way I could pass other than if I was coming in with a broom in my hand. But I did get a chance to talk with a number of interesting white students who were here at that time. Um, I've got a few other instances too about, about that, so I'm going to move on. Let me just say this to you that I want you to understand that the city and movement, the freedom ride movement, in my view, was really a movement whose time had come. Uh, it was Victor Hugo who said, there's nothing, and I'm paraphrasing, there's nothing on earth so powerful as an idea whose time has come. And the time had come for the progeny of the ex slaves and the slaves to stand up and be counted. The time had come for these young individuals to represent the class as opposed to having one person or two persons 
representative class. Now, what do I mean by that? When the NAACP was founded in 1909, uh, there were only two black people there. Uh, one of them was W.B. Du Bois. Other was Ida B. Wells. <clears throat> A very conscious strategy was developed, namely that we need to legally attack the spatial system of segregation in this country. Now, as background, Atlanta had a violent riot in 1906 uh, down in downtown Five Points. And then in 1908 in Springfield, Illinois, there was another violent riot there. And black men primarily in the next all over the place. So the NACP thought we've got to stop this lynching. And uh, they formed this organization, named the board at the head of the of the Crisis Magazine, which he held for years and years and years. But they also realized that if you're going to challenge this system that is so ingrained in the southern states, supported indirectly by the northern states, you couldn't go out here and put too many people on the line by the names on a lawsuit. So they had to find some one or some people to represent the class. In other words, this lady right here, similar to situated with the rest of you, a student here, we would the lawsuit in her name, in her individual capacity, and also representing the rest of you collectively. So if there was economic reprisals that were going to be inflicted on the, on the class. The only person named was this person. Now, trust me, that was a very, very reasonable and prudent fear. Because the South used every terroristic means at their disposal. Al-Qaeda doesn't have a thing on the South when it comes to trying to hold on to a system. And I'll finish up on some of that later on. The NACP pursued this, this particular strategy for a long time. And they were winning all the way with the lawyers. Now, along comes World War I. And Dr. Du Bois tells African Americans, Negroes, black people, let's put our push for rights on the shelf. And let's go and fight in World War I in Europe for the freedom of people in Europe. And what we will be doing is writing a check with America, a check that could be cashed because we paid for it with our blood when you come back and that your children and your grandchildren can benefit from your suffering today. So that was a lot of controversy, but Du Bois was big, he was huge. Blacks joined in great numbers. One of the most decorated units was the unit out of Maryland. Came to France and routed the uh, Germans. Got all kinds of medals, French crosses that unit. But when many of those soldiers came back to this country, before they could get off the trains at their hometowns, many of them were beaten, mistreated, you name it. So Du Bois's theory was a nice theory, but in fact it didn't work. Because what he did not take into full account at the time was the the viciousness and the uh, insidious nature of this thing called racism. I submit to you today that the most vicious disease ever have been known to inflict mankind is disease where one group doesn't like another group. In America, it's basically racism. But it's also, it could be women too. Let's flash to today. Look at what's going on in the issue of whether or not we can get, can get contraceptives. 
I mean, most of the people who are opposing it are not women. The other folks who don't know what it means to have to have that kind of protection from having children. So it's an ethnocentric thing, us versus them. And in this instance, throughout the South, the us were white Anglo-Saxon people. And the them were, or the other, were African Americans. Concurrent with our people getting on these trains trying to go home and what have you, we found a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. And that the Klan had been outlawed in the late 1800s by the federal government, but somehow or another, we looked the other way, the feds did, and they organized again, and one of their major national offices was where? Atlanta, Georgia. Georgia was a hotbed for them. Let me flash forward, there's a lot more I can say about that, but let me go forward to World War II. We were asked one more time, as African Americans, as Negroes, to fight in that war. Segregated units. We did that because every time America had called upon the ex slaves and their progeny to come to the aid of their country, they did and shed that blood. But out of that campaign, Walter White at the NACP and many others, A. Philip Randolph developed a V, a two V, a double V campaign. Victory in Europe, Japan, victory in America. V meant victory for us and our rights, those of us who descended from Africa. When the war was over, Truman was pressured to desegregate the armed forces. Now, the one thing that the history books don't talk about a lot, young people, is the fact that it was the Monroe uh, lynchings in about 1946-47, I think it was, that was the catalyst for Truman desegregating the army and also setting up a commission on civil rights. I think it was called to secure these rights. Walter White took him to the Atlanta Journal the Atlanta Constitution and showed him what was going on. And Truman incredulously said, I didn't know it was that bad. Let's do something about it. Now, mind you, now, Truman was not a liberal, but he was the president. And he took the position of being president to meet up all the people. And if you go back and look at his history, you see a history where when he was president, most of the time he made decisions that would do the best for the largest number of people. He overcame his upbringing and the war's over. 1.1 million African American men mostly are coming back from that war, mostly to the South. And I'm reminded, as I tell you that, of a letter that I wrote, that I read at the Library of Congress in the NAACP files. There was a letter in there from uh, and that, uh, a soldier from Birmingham, Alabama. And in that letter, he said, why am I fighting the Germans? They haven't done anything to me. I need to be in Alabama fighting the Bull Connors of the world. Those 1.1 million men and women came back, and they saw some discrimination, just like the people who came before them in World War I. But, a lot of them had a chance to see a different kind of world. And they were able to instill in their young people, and I was one of them, that things could be better. That they'd been to France, they'd seen how things could be if only we could end the slavery by another name called segregation. Concurrent with that, the old colonialist powers Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, because of the strain of that war, World War II, they were not able to hold on to, from a 
economic point of view, that form of commons that they caved, that they carved up in Berlin in 1884. So freedom was beginning to reign all over. It was in the air. Colonialism was in. India got, got its freedom. Nigeria got its freedom. Ghana got its freedom. Then in that same milieu comes along Jackie Robinson in a great baseball. And then Earl Rowe in a great basketball. It's amazing what you can do with sports, like ping pong diplomacy. So all of this is happening. But let me add, I don't know how many of the physics majors, but there's something called potential energy and kinetic energy. And what was happening is that within the class, all of this potential energy was being developed like a volcano almost, you follow me? Waiting to erupt when all the right circumstances were around. So by 1960, I submit to you that the class that this lady had been representing alone by herself all of a sudden say, wait a minute, let's let the class speak. And when those four young boys sat down in Greensboro on the 1st of February 1960, that was the catalyst, that was the enzyme that took the people out here who were a part of this mass that were waiting, and they exploded. Now, I don't know how many of you are Christians. And I don't want to ask you, I'm going to talk about that, but I want to say, tell you this. There's one thing in the Bible that I, read, that I remember. And I'm going to paraphrase it again, but I think I read something where in some parable said, and the children shall leave them. And I was 23 years old, and I was an old time. I'd come back from the war. Most of the folks were between 16 and 21 roughly. And when I read the newspaper on the 2nd of February 1960, the Atlantic Constitution, and saw where these four young fellows had sat down all day at Woolworths just requesting a sandwich, I told my friend Joe Pierce, who had run my campaign when I was running president of the student government social media association in high school, I said, Joe, we don't have to change this. He agreed, and then I said, let's go talk to Julian. I had met Julian Bond when I came back in 57. Uh, back in Morehouse one of those days, Dr. Hayden, I'm sure you heard about it, although you might, because you knew too young to know about it. <laughs> it. It used to be an all-day affair to register in college. Standing line, standing line. So I was in the administration building for nine hours, just sitting there. And the guy sitting standing next to me, or sitting next to me, was Julian Bond. And so I learned everything about him, everything about me. <laughs> and I learned that he had been a, an intern for Time Magazine when he was in high school. Because he was a brilliant writer. Even then. And so I got him to join us. And we went around, we organized all over the place to get the students to join us. And what I also learned is that the College presidents at that time, and may be true today, even at this university, the college presidents had their, their antenna out. And so within a few days, Dr. Mays, the secretary, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, president of Morehouse College, and then it was Mrs. Hill, she came down to where I hung out and, at the drugstore. <laughs> um, well, now, if you went to Morehouse and you, know, and you knew who she was, you knew she was representing Dr. Mays, and you knew you had better get up and go see what she wanted. And so I went over and asked him, and said, what's up? Dr. Mays wants to see you in the president's conference room at 3 o'clock this afternoon. I said, what's it about? She said, you'll find out when you get there. Okay. And then she did the same thing with Joe Peters. And to Julia. So we all knew we were going to the mountaintop. <laughs> we didn't know what was going to happen. When we walked into that room that afternoon, 
young people. All of the students that I had been talking to were in that room. Plus some other students who were heads of the SGA and all that kind of stuff. So Dr. Rufus Pender was his name, president of AU, graduate of Wisconsin University, PhD in, uh, I forgot the history of it was. He was the chairman and he began to tell us to go back to class. He said, I can understand how you feel. He said, because I'm a Negro, just as you, but I have a responsibility as the trustee for these students here. We cannot afford to have these students beat up by these state troopers and, and city police. This college would be liable for that. Plus, he said, let's let the NACP handle this matter. Let's let the class, the one they represent the class, do this. When you mentioned the NACP, I knew the next thing was going to be Dr. Mays, because Mays was the chairman of the NACP Life Membership Committee. So Mays comes in. And he echoes what Dr. Clinton said. And I said, you know, they covered the books on us. They got together. But we still listen. We have to listen to those presidents. We got to the man from Spelman, uh, Dr. Manley, who said the same thing. And then the president of Clark College said something that I will always remember. He said, if you go downtown to challenge segregation, sit at this lunch counters, you're going to embarrass me. I couldn't believe he said a college president would say that. But he did. And then, young people, the next person in line was Dr. Harry B. Richardson, the president of ICC, and took the nomination of the Elizabeth Center. Dr. Richardson paused for about 10 seconds before he said anything. But when he did speak, he said, I think the students are right. You could have heard a rat do what? <laughs> because the presidents were shocked that somebody had broken, you know, so and said something different from what they had agreed to do. And when he made his little he made his eloquent speech, the next person speaking was Dr. Frank Cunningham, the president of Marsh Brown. And he said, I agree with Dr. Richardson. He said, oh, no. <laughs> we got him now. We have a split. It was four against two, but still we had to split. Clement, brilliant man, said, I tell you what let's do. I don't think it's the right thing. You shouldn't go down there. But if you're going to do something, do something that will stand the test of time. And we said, well, what is that, Dr. Clement? He said, why don't you write up a list of reasons as to why you are going to be doing whatever you're going to, you think you're going to do. And we agreed to do that. Now, what he really thought was that if he could get us to write this document, this manifesto, then, and because we were considered to be the intellectual elite of black colleges in America, then that would be our contribution to this movement, and we'd go back to class. <laughs> so I said, uh, okay, we'll write it. But what I did tell Dr. Clement was that I had another strategy. I appointed um, Dr. Rosalind Pope, who was a student at the time, to write the appeal, assisted by Julian and Ann and others. But I also appointed somebody else to put together the first demonstrations. Now, Dr. Clement raised the money to pay for the full page ad. And that document, maybe I can get it to. Uh, have you seen the document, Dr. Yeah, we have. Okay. That document is probably the most important document that was written by students during that time. Uh, your governor of Georgia, graduate of this great institution, Governor Vanderbilt, said that the document had to have been written in Moscow. And he said, no college student, he didn't say black or Negro, no college student in Georgia could have written that document. Now, that tells you how far out of the government was in terms of, we had come a long way from slavery, but he didn't know it. We had come a long way from segregation, but he didn't know it. But anyway, having said that, that document appeared in the major newspapers in Atlanta. Senator Jacob Javits introduced it in the congressional record so that it would be there in perpetuity. 
And the New York Times, without even talking to us, ran the entire ad, full page in the, in the New York Times. So we're really proud of having done that. That, that document is now being used to teach teachers all around the South about what it was like during that period of time. Let me just say to you that when we began to move forward, we had to fight something else that I want you all to remember. Whenever you're going to try to change an entrenched power, you've got to really work over time. And you have to work over time, especially when you have to do something that's going to risk your life. We had to battle not only the white racists, the mayor, the rich people in Buckingham of Atlanta. We also had to battle the old line Negro leadership, who rightly saw that if we won this battle, where were they going to be? So we had to really run with the foxes and chase with the hounds. We could never have won the battle that mattered to the city days of lunch counters, the restaurants, the uh, public places, places of uh, eating that, that were like lunch rooms. We could not have gotten the cashiers. Uh, we could not have gotten uh, the segregation of all the courthouses. Put them right there. In a hall of justice. Now, let me tell you what was going on. We were challenging the system. But when you came to court in Atlanta, you had to sit on a certain side of the court based on your race, courtroom. There were no signs, but it was known culturally that if a white person sat on the right-hand side of the courtroom, everybody behind that person had to be white. And then there was an aisle there, the other side, and if a black person turned over there, all folks were black. And the reverse, if a white person turned over there first, everyone was going to be white. So when I was arrested in the early part of February 1961, and I came to court, I walked in and the court was packed. Except there were some seats on the white side. And I said, just like I, I did when I came to Athens, <laughs> I said, you know, why am I going to go in here and sit in a segregated part of this courtroom when I'm going to be challenging the whole system? It's a challenge this too. And so when I said I'm going to sit on the white side, I pulled in this film and said, we're going to go with you. So we sat on the back seat, and Judge Paul Webb, who was presiding, stopped the court. Amen. Go back there and arrest that boy. Leave the girls alone, they just follow him. Bring him down here. And so they came and got me, two of them, and took me down there. And he said, uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm sitting on the side of the courtroom that I'm going to sit on. Don't you know our customs? I said, yes, but I disagree with you. I'm going to sentence you to as long as I can to a contempt of court. And they put me in jail for five hours. I just sat in a cell for five hours. They finally let me out. Well, of course, we sued them later on. I got all that stuff changed. But the bottom line is, you know, if I, it, it, was a, it would have been a dichotomy for me to have come in there challenging the system and then sitting down supporting the system. I had the same situation when I went. I worked at the post office at the time I was uh, leading all these things. And the post office had, the federal post office had the same deal. They had a color swing room and a white swing room. In the meantime, I'm, I have picketers going all around Richard's department store. It's, it's Macy's now. The Klan was on the other side. We were on this side. So nobody was coming to the town because nobody wanted to be heard. And so I, went, so I said, wait a minute, why am I going to go down here? The same lot that I did before and go to the left of the color swing room and just forget about the white. I went down there, and when I got to the aisle, I turned right rather than left, and I went into the white swing room. Oh, oh, pandemonium broke out <laughs> in this federal establishment. But I didn't move. I ate my lunch. Nobody bothered me. But 
it was clear that I was breaking the mold. So the next night I went down, a guy named Tom Harris said, I'm not going to make you get killed by yourself. He came down with me. So after about three or four nights of us going down, going to the right and to the left, the signs came down because they realized that it was building, it was building, and they knew it was wrong. Now, let me talk about this movement just a little bit more. When you are going to form a movement, young people, you've got to find, you've got to identify where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are. The weakness was that we did not have the support of the black leadership in Atlanta. We didn't have the support of the white leadership in Atlanta. But because I had been taught, taught economics at Morehouse and had been taught by well-known economists, um, Dr. Hugo Scholar, whom I mentioned to uh, Dr. Clayton earlier, he was the former Minister of Finance for Jefferson Valley in 1948 when the economists took over. He came to AU. I took a lot of courses out of AU because you could do that during that time. And I learned a lot about return on investment. I learned a lot about what was the model of profit for stores. The model of profit for a department store was between 8 and 10 percent. Well, the African American community in Atlanta was 33 percent of the population at that time. So, okay, the light went off. See, I'm going to tell you something. I understand why they want my four parents to learn how to read and write. Because you learn how to read and write, you can begin to think and think how you can solve something. So I employed the economics theories that I had learned, and I said, what we need to do is to run a selective buying campaign. Now, I had heard about buying campaigns before, back in Harlem and in a lot of other places, where you work hard for jobs and what have you. So I knew a little bit about that having been, having learned how to read, I guess. And so we began to organize. Now, why did we organize the people? We knew that we could only win if we convinced the public, the Negro public, to stop shopping downtown. And if they would do that, then we would be able to win. We also knew that we needed a newsletter or some kind of publication. Because the Atlanta Constitution and the Atlanta Journal would not write our stories after a while. And the Atlanta Day in the World, the black newspaper, wouldn't write our stories after a while. I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but anyway. So we put something together called the Student Movement in You. You should know to know what a mimeograph sheet is. <laughs> but we actually mimeographed 11 by 17 pages front and back, and we listed all of our demands, and we circled 20,000 per Sunday at these churches on car windows. The result of that was that we began to get the class involved. Now, mind you now, the average wage of a black person in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1960 was $5 a day, okay? And if you were a maid, you at least got coffee. Five dollars a day. But if you're talking about thousands of people making five dollars a day, and they all had richest departments or charge accounts, charge accounts, you can have a leverage. The other thing I said to the leadership was this. I said, John Foster Dulles, former Secretary of State under Eisenhower, had a theory called the domino theory that he put together during the Cold War. And his theory was that if one part of the Asian Pacific Basin falls, like Korea, Vietnam, and you name it, then the rest will fall to communism like the hundreds. So the theory was simply to this. If you can bring down Richard's department store, which is the largest department store in the South, the rest of the folks will be very happy to go along. Like dominoes. And that is what happened. Now, one more component that we use. The Federal Reserve during that time used to 
run every Sunday a review of how business was doing in Atlanta. And they ran articles saying that the sales were down 5%, 10%. And that, we would hurt get some of the papers to see how effective was the boycott. Now, let me give you an anecdote. How many of you, if I was a 23-year-old college student, asking you to send me your visa card would do it? Because there's a movement that I'm pushing. How many of you in this room would actually send your card to a college student you've never seen, never met, just he made the appeal to? Probably nobody. We made the appeal in Atlanta, Georgia, and 353 people sent me their credit card from Richard's department store. 353. Now, what does that mean? That means that we had moved to the point where we had scratched the surface and we went down to the innermost parts of these people's souls. And they, you see, for people to say that black folks were happy to be slaves was a flat out lie. They were not happy to be slaves. They couldn't do anything about it. They attempted 251 times to escape slavery, and every time a fellow slave sold them out and the slave revolt ended. So therefore, the masses of people, they don't want to get hurt. But, but they, this is a this way for them to, I guess you would say, support the movement quietly with their pocketbooks. And once those sales got to a certain point, we knew it was just a matter of not brother, but win. But then I want to mention one more thing to you. As an organizer during the summer of 1960, going to all these places, speaking to groups smaller than this, if I could get two people together, I want to talk to them. Because I knew that I was not going to win with the landed gentry, with the powerful people who had enjoyed all the privileges of, of that day. So, when I moved in this direction, I said, let's do this. Let's find a way to put the plight of African Americans into the presidential election in 1960. I said, if you had come here from Mars and you watched Kennedy and Nixon debate, you wouldn't know that 70,000 black students all over the Southland are changed to the Southland. They were, they were afraid to touch the issue. Well, I had been baptized from the time I left. I left all in Georgia. Well, Southwest Georgia in 1945, and I joined Ebenezer Baptist Church, baptized my daddy King. He was Reverend King then, he became Daddy King later. And I met Martin King, who was a teenager during that time. And we were friends all, all through the years, and his brother and I had a paper route together, those kind of things. And what I said was that we need to send a telegram to both of the candidates, Nixon and Kennedy, asking them to take a stand on what was going on and discuss it on TV. And I said, but before we do that, let me talk to you to, uh, to our email, well, Dr. King. And I called and I said, uh, here's my plan. And, and can I get you to go to jail with us? And I said, because if you go to jail with us because of your fame for Montgomery, it will become an international story. And he would put pressure on these people who were running for president. I wasn't for Nixon or Kennedy. I was for what was right. And I wasn't sure where they were on that issue, okay? King and King agreed. And so we sent off the telegrams. So the night, the morning before, we were going to go down to town and go to all these places, October 19, 1960. I was talking to the ladies this government. And uh, I asked Dr. Herschel, Sal, Shell, Noah, Southern, then to go call uh, Reverend King and tell him to meet me on the bridge at uh, 10 o'clock the following morning. Richards, Richards had what they call the bridge cafeteria. In between Forsyth and, and uh, it was, was Forsyth Street and Broad Street on this side, the main building, Forsyth Street, and then the store of homes. So she came back and she said, Lonnie, he said he can't go. 
to say. So he said he can't go because he's on probation, having uh, been arrested for carrying Lydia Smith to the airport. You all know who Lydia Smith was, right? Like, kill us, kill us a dream. Okay. Okay. She is a, a white, she's dead now, she's a white writer who was very famous, who wrote a lot of stories about segregation and desegregation in the Southland. Uh, maybe you've got a chance to look her name up. She was a tremendous Southern writer. I said, well, Hershey I'll hold on to talk to this dude while I go and talk to him, because he promised me that he would go. So when I got to the phone, he was Dr. King on the phone, and Dad on the phone, and Bell on the phone, and Y.T. Walker on the phone, and all these lines up there. But I want to talk to him, and he was giving me all the details of why he couldn't go. And his dad was screaming at me because he had baptized him and so forth and so on. <laughs> so I ignored him, though. I respected him, but I just ignored him. <laughs> and so I said to I said, I said, uh, I said, uh, hey, man, let me say something to you. You are the moral leadership of this movement, whether you want to be it, be it or not. And you promised me you were going to go. I said, now, they arrested you for driving somebody to the airport. Just who happened to be of the wrong color. I said, that's wrong. I said, and if you are going to be the leader, you got to be. And I remember the sermon that his dad preached when I was young. And the title of that sermon was, you can't lead from the back. You got to lead from the front. And I brought that out, and I mentioned that, and I knew I could shut him up. <laughs> and so he said, LC, they call me LC. He said, where should I meet you at 10 o'clock? I said, I'm on the bridge. And he met me at 10 o'clock on the bridge, and we, we went to jail, and the rest is history. Every African-American community switched their vote from Nixon to Kennedy, except one, Atlanta, Georgia, at his hometown. Why did it happen? There's a man named John Calhoun, who now is dead, but he was a tremendous organizer, who taught me all I know about organizing people. The man, the man was brilliant, and he, he kept Atlanta in the Nixon column in the black community, in spite of Martin King going to jail. Now, I don't know how much you talk about leadership in your classes, but there was a crisis of enlightened leadership within the African American community. The only adult who went to jail with us in 1960 61 was Martin King Jr. Not another adult. Why? Because they were part of the group. They didn't want to be singled out. Let me give you an example. You've got a lady here who, who teaches as a, as a you know, professor here, Mrs. Hobbs. She was arrested with us in 1960 on March the uh, 15th. And they put her name and all the other 82 people's names in the paper. They put in their names, their ages, their, their, what school they were going to, and what hometown they came from. Now, why was all of that? It was done to say, if you know anybody who knows these interlopers, these niggas who don't know that place, buy their relatives. That's what that meant. Let me give you my other point on this, and then I go on and try to come to a conclusion here. Another point. I had a press conference about 6.30 one evening at the height of the movement, and I was on TV, and my mother worked for a woman named Elizabeth Mitchell, whose dad built the Hurt Building downtown Atlanta. My mother called, said that Miss Mitchell and my mother were in the, I guess, I guess like the little recreation room or whatever, my mother was, she was a maid, working for her five dollars a day, whatever. So she was with us and watching TV. And so Miss Mitchell, I understand, my, my mother said, looked at me, and looked at my mother, looked back at me, looked at my mother. Imagine that my name was King and her name was Thrasher. She had married again. She and my dad had divorced and so she married again in 41. And it was Bertha Thrasher. And so I understand that Miss Mitchell said, Bertha, do you know that boy? And my mother said, no. And that night my phone rang. And it was my mother crying hysterically telling me that she had to disown 
her only child, lest she lose her $5 a day and come from the job. That's how vicious the system was, okay? Quickly, it wasn't just cities. We had something called neoliberalism. We, knew, we went to major white churches and to worship. Of course, they tried to keep us out. And it was interesting to see them wrestle with their Christian conscience. But we did that deliberately. Because Martin King had said we, we agreed that 11 o'clock in America was the most segregated hour of the week. And so we challenged that. Freedom rights. We all know what a great job James Foma did. But he wasn't the first one. The first one was really early in the, in the, in the 40s. And he wasn't the first one in 1960, 61. The Atlanta group, and we have the minutes to prove all of this, and the, the arrest records and people, we actually decided to test Bornton versus Virginia, which is what the case was all about. And we went to, from Atlanta, we went on the bus to Birmingham, to Jacksonville, to Memphis, and to Columbia, South Carolina. And our folks got arrested, so there's all kinds of reports on it. Claude Sitton, who was the Washington, no, who was Atlanta editor for the um, Wall Street Journal, not Wall Street Journal, the, the New York Times, interviewed me and wrote an article about it. And I got a call from James Farmer. Said, well, Lonnie, because I knew him. Tell me more about what you all did. So I told him, he said, well, we're going to come next spring and do the same thing. But we're going to start in Washington, D.C. and go south. I said, well, you probably have a very uneventful ride from Washington, D.C., but when you leave Atlanta and you start and get to Anderson, Alabama, you're going to run into the Adams boys who own that base, that service station, that status station right on your right. Be careful. He did come to me and we did talk and I, I warned one of them again about it. And you know the rest of that. Why do we have civilians? Why do we have neoliberals? Why did we pick it? All this. Why do we risk our lives? Some of us got beaten, uh, kicked, spat on, killed, you name it. Why? We did it because if, if we didn't do it, who was going to do it? We had seen since 1619 people pleading to ask people who were colonists first and then Americans later to make the Declaration of Independence the first line we hope these truths to be self evident, etc. Meaning something. But what happened, class, when they formed the Constitution, the final document that we're now under, they threw out the Declaration of Independence, and certainly those words about all things being equal, and they put together a slave document controlled by South Carolina, backed up by Georgia. The same two people who forced them to take out a condemnation of slavery in the original Declaration. South Carolina took the position we want to count the slaves as three-fifths of a person for congressional representation. We want an electoral college. Because you know us, you got more people up there. We want you outvoting us. So they created the electoral college. They put in the Fugitive Slave Act in your federal constitution. And then when they had the Federalist, anti-Federalist Federalist discussions and debates, the South said, we need to have a Bill of Rights. And so they shook hands and said, we'll give you one. And of course, they did give them one. On a handshake, the amendments, the first 10 amendments, like free speech, you name it. It came from the South. Let me flash you forward and try to conclude. If you've got questions, I'll answer those questions. Flash you forward. I put this in quotation marks. I retired some time ago, because you know what? I really was not even enough to believe that once you change the law, you could then go back home because people in the long run, if you change their overt behavior based on the law, according to Lester Ward, in the long run, you would change their overall behavior. If people get accustomed to 
see, in an open society, they'll stop challenging it. And that's true to a great extent, but not enough people have done it. But why is it that? Why is it? Because some of the people who challenged us, their children and grandchildren are now around. And that's another expression now. You know, the acorn not falling, the apple not falling, far from the tree. We have a lot of people who were taught by their foreparents that, their, that people who were not Western European were less than. They even did not like Slavs and, and Italians initially. But they changed a little bit on that issue. So where are we now? We're now in the 21st century. And unfortunately, young people, we're having to fight some of the same battles that we fought in 1960. But it's even worse. Georgia's high schools are dropout factors now. Georgia's K through 12 is predominantly non-white. Yet all the school board members statewide are white except one. There are 13 of them. But it's a 10 plus billion dollar a year budget, and all the money is being controlled by the same kind of people who controlled it in 1960. So where are the voices? The voices will have to come from young people. Because if the voices don't come from you, we're going to all go down the hill. Somebody's got to stand up for we hold these truths in contradiction to we the people. Or to define we the people to mean something other than white, Anglo-Saxon, man, Egyptian men. I got a whole lot more I can talk to you about. I'm going to come to the top of my conclusion. Now that Dr. Clayton has stood up, she gave me the same as I, I appreciate it. Thank you.